that changed Christianity. And one of the main scriptures I cited was in Acts 20. And let's go to Acts 20 and verse 28. And I'll cite this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Paul's warning to the church elders at Ephesus. Okay, Ephesus. This was a church that, that Paul raised up. And later on, the apostle John was going to center his ministry on it when he was exiled and when he was forced out of, of Jerusalem. But Paul warned the church's elders at Ephesus. He said this and here in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, he said, be on guard for yourselves and for the, all the flock that the Holy Spirit has appointed you to, to as overseers. This is the episcopos, as bishops, okay, in some translations. The, the, the Holy Spirit has appointed you as bishops, as overseers to the flock of God to shepherd the church of God, which this church of God, which he, that is Christ, purchased with his own blood. The church is purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's founded, the chief cornerstone, it's founded on the apostles and prophets, but the chief cornerstone is Christ. And he, Paul, Apostle Paul said this, and he made this prophecy here in verse 29. This is Acts 20, 29. This is a prophecy of the, that, that came through the Apostle Paul. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and men will arise up from your own number, from among the bishops, the episcopos, the elders, the overseers of the church. Men would rise up of your own uh, number with what? deviant doctrines to lure the disciples in to follow them. Paul prophesied that there were going to be bishops, there were going to be, or the Episcopos, the elders, the ministers of the church would rise up and bring in deviant doctrines. This word uh, for deviant is diastropho. Diastropho, properly, it's turned thoroughly, perverted into a new shape, distorted, twisted. It's the opposite of what it should be, the true form. The deviant doctrines. Then in 3 John, 3 John chapter 1 and verse 9, there's only one chapter in 3 John anyways, but it's uh, 3 John, uh, a, a letter that John sent out to the faithful churches, okay, at, towards this was towards the end of his life in the 90s AD. John said this, to the church. I have written briefly to the church, but diatrophies, you know, very similar to this word uh, diastropho, uh, is very, you know, very close. As you look at this, it almost could be a play on words. But I have written briefly to the church, but diatrophes, which means in the Greek, cherished by Zeus, okay, which is, this is what uh, makes me think very clearly that this was not this man's real name, but was sort of a play on words and everybody would sort of understand this guy was cherished by a false god, okay. But Diotrephes, who likes to take the lead among them and put himself first does not acknowledge my authority, John said, the Apostle John said, and refuses to accept my suggestions or listen to me. Verse 10, so when I arrive, I will call attention to what he is doing, his boiling over and his cast his malicious reflections upon us with insinuating language. This is written in the late 90 ADs. And there was trouble that was going on. And not satisfied with that, he refuses to receive and welcome the brethren himself and also interferes with and forbids those who would welcome them and tries to excommunicate them from the church. This fellow was trying to put people out of the church who were connected with the apostle John, who were faithful men. And John was warning the churches about this fellow who was, you know, who, who was in the pocket of a false god. You know, and then I cited in that, a couple weeks ago, I cited that, you know, that about the time that the apostle John was writing, we have the historical record from AD 96, and that's in the first century, during the uh, very close of the apostle John's lifetime, we have this letter that was written by Clement, who was a man named Clement, who was Bishop of Rome, and he wrote a letter to the church at Corinth to settle this score that it broke out in the church and resulted in the excommunication of a number of the elders of the church there in Corinth. And this letter, uh, it, 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 he is, 
you know, he's threatening in this letter. He says, if anyone disobeys what has been said by him through us, let them know that they will involve themselves in no slight transgression or danger. He was threatening the people who were contesting what was going on in Corinth. And this letter is known, this claim by the uh, Bishop of Rome, Clement, there in 96 AD, as the epiphany of the Roman primacy claim. This was the beginning of them claiming in Rome that we are the boss. We can tell people what to do. Remember what John said. Here is this man. He wanted to take the lead among them and put himself first. And he was refusing to acknowledge the Apostle John's authority. And they were calling them names. They were saying things, things like they were Judaizers. He was calling the Apostle John this, the one who is the beloved Apostle. Anyways, we, I also covered um, uh, two weeks ago about the historians, the Greek historians, uh, Eusebius and Epiphanius, who wrote two to three hundred years, these two historians, after the death of the Apostle John. Both of these historians, Eusebius and Epiphanius. Both of them inform us that the Church of God at Jerusalem up to the time of the siege of the city by the pagan Roman Emperor Hadrian in 135 AD, it, that, that the bishops, the elders, the episcopos of the Church of God at Jerusalem were converted Hebrews and that there were 15 of these bishops or, or episcopos or, or governing elders who had ruled, uh, who had administered the Church of God in Jerusalem. And their distinguishing characteristic was keeping the Passover on the 14th of Nisan, as well as the observance of the weekly Sabbath on the seventh day. This is a historical fact a historical fact by two established uh, historians. We still have, <laughs> and some of these are in the Vatican Library, but you know, they've been copied and are distributed around. But they, we, they, these two historians make the point that for 100 years after the death of Jesus and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that the Church of God at Jerusalem, led by, led by these, the bishops and elders, had kept the Passover on the 14th of Nisan and had kept the seventh day Sabbath. That was their distinguishing characteristic. You know, and it was during that time, after the Emperor Hadrian in 135 AD, when he had destroyed Jerusalem once more and there had been the second Jewish rebellion, that the Church of Rome, the Church at Rome, the Bishop of Rome, uh, the various bishops of Rome, started to adopt the policies of reconciliation towards the pagan Roman Empire and a radical differentiation from anything that could be thought of as Jewish anything such as the seventh day sabbath such as keeping the passover on the 14th of nisan they began to say that anybody the bishops of rome who did these things they were calling them judaizers it was a it was a fighting words if you want to put it and they could denounce them to the roman authorities because they were very unpopular because of this political rebellion that had taken place the second time they did second time. The first one was in, that was crushed in, by 70 A.D. and the second one there in 135 A.D. Well, last week I mentioned binding and loosening. You know, the concept of binding and loosening has a long established history of as a Jewish legal term. Scholars have noted it was translated directly into the Greek uh, in the New Covenant scriptures and it was taken, borrowed directly over from the, uh, from the, from the rabbis. It was a rabbinical court term. It's how, it was a legal term. This uh, binding and loosening was a legal term among the Jewish community there in the, the Holy Land. Now, I mentioned that the Roman Catholic Church insists that as the successor to St. Peter, okay, as the successor to St. Peter, that the popes have the authority to institute or bind, that's the bind, that's the tie or fasten on customs, you know, whether we're talking about like Sunday worship or Easter, and they have the authority to loose, okay, such things as the Seventh-day Sabbath and uh, Passover observances. They can decide what's going to be observed. That's what they're making. They make this claim. They very clearly, they make the claim they have the authority to decide what should be observed, 
uh, or what should not be. They th believe and they claim they have the authority to bring in all sorts of new customs. They, they do this. Now, I cited to you, uh, and again, Matthew 16, 19, and I cited the Amplified Version, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, the Roman Catholic Church takes this scripture and right before the Vatican Palace, okay, where all these fellows have been meeting for the last few, last few days, okay, and on all the, the, on the walls and uh, different places throughout the Vatican, they have this symbol for the Pope where he has these keys, okay? You will see, you can see them. You'll see them in pictures that are being taken right now, but they're taking this from 19, uh, uh, excuse me, Matthew 16, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth, okay, and here's where the amplified version is a little different from maybe from what you're going to read in your Bible, must be what is already bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. Well, I noted that the amplified version uh, translation varied significantly from most other translations, such as the English Standard Version, which is which is typical, where in verse 19 is rendered, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know, what does your version say? You know, if you take a look, you know, we, we, does it have it more like the Amplified, or does it have it more like the ESV? This sort of translation plainly teaches, you know, this one done by the ESV, that whatever is authorized by men seems like, you know, is rubber stamped in heaven. You know, if, if you decide it on earth, bam, it's, it's done, you know, okay? And, you know, from this standpoint that uh, you notice here in the English Standard Version, when they say, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, okay, they are translating this in the future tense, something that's going to take place after what you do. Okay, that's how the ESV translates, and that's how most of your common translations, most of the common ones we have in English, that's how it translates it. But, you know, I've, I've already pointed out, the Amplified Bible, the Coulter Bible, and the scholarly translation of uh, the, the New Covenant Scriptures by Charles B. Williams, they clearly note that the original Greek text, okay, and it shows that the tense in Greek, in the original Greek, is not in the future. Rather, the original Greek tense is in the, what I said was the perfect passive participle. Okay, the perfect passive participle. Now, for many of you, your eyes are going to glaze over at this point, right? Is it the perfect passive participle. What is he talking about? I mean, they haven't been teaching English grammar in our schools, public schools, for, well, you know, hundred, you know, I don't know. Hey, I don't want to say, I'm, you know, I know I'm a dinosaur since I was a kid, you know? I mean, we, they started teaching some of this grammar and different, you know, uh, all the different aspects when I was in the public school. That's a long time ago. It's been a couple generations, you know, that since we've had really taught grammar. But I've learned, you know, and I've studied Hebrew, I've studied Arabic, I've studied French. And when you study a, a language that is not your, your own and you're learning to write and speak in it, you have to actually study the, the bones of the language, the structure of the language, how it's put together. So I got to learn something about the perfect passive participle. It's Charles Williams, as I said, who's a scholar, one of the people that looked at this, he, he, he said this in his marginal notes on this verse. He said, the perfect passive participle here, referring to a state of having been already forbidden or permitted. The perfect passive participle always gives a sense of something having happened previously okay, in the past before the event that has taken place. It's already happened. And it's perfect, when we call it perfect passive participle, it's perfect because it's already completed. It's passive because it was done by somebody other than the main subject of the phrase. So when we look at Matthew 16, 19, Okay, and read that. It's I, okay, and the speaker is Jesus, give you, 
okay, Peter, and that's who he was speaking to there in Matthew 16, 19 directly, because Peter got the question right, okay. Peter was a good student. He put up his hand. He said, I got you then. Jesus said, you got the question right. And he said, I, uh, I, Jesus, the teacher, the master, will give you, Peter, the disciple, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind, that is, to, you know, here on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. Okay, is this a carte blanche? Is this saying that Peter can do whatever you want? No, it's not what it says. And whatever you bind on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. The binding, time-wise, is already completed or perfected in heaven. And it's passive, okay, is the perfect passive because Peter's not doing the binding. Heaven is doing the binding. You notice that. Whatever you bind on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, and I mentioned uh, last week that the Greek word here is Strong's 3080, luo, on earth, must be what is already loosed in heaven. Same tense. So if you're going to make something binding or you're going to lose something, okay, it's got to already have been done in heaven before. By heaven, it's not by you. It's passive, okay? You're not doing the binding. Now this week, you know, I, I, by the way, last week I also talked about marriage and divorce as one of the examples. Check it out on COG webcast. We have them archived. You know, it's there. If we might, you know, the, you know they've, we've gone through it. And it, it, you know, it's, there it is anyways. But this week I want to ask you, and I want to ask this question once more. I've gone over this for a reason. Does the Roman Catholic Church, does the Bishop of Rome have the authority to bind and to loose when it comes to the observance of the Passover festival as recorded in the scriptures? Does he have the authority to change it to a non-scriptural festival such as Easter? and the preceding part of Lent and this sort of thing. You know, they're getting ready. The church in Rome, they want to have a new pope in power because they want in there when they have the biggest time of the year in their, in their liturgical schedule, which is Easter. It is a big, big deal. The world's Christians, most of them, what, 99.9% are going to be doing Easter. And who are we, as April Fools, as it were, you know, doing Passover? Does, you know, most people think the Roman Catholic Church has that authority, do they? Well, let's take a look here. I want to just explore this a little more. Okay, let's just take a look. Let's go to Matthew 18, Matthew chapter 18 in the Amplified. I want to look at this. <coughs> Matthew 18, and I'm going to start at verse 1, okay? Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, and I'm going to read this in Amplified, okay? Amplified always takes your words and some of your key words and expands them a little bit to give you the real flavor, so you just don't read over it, you think about it. At that time, the disciples, okay, notice it's the disciples. That's, this is plural. It's not just Peter. Not just Peter. It's all of them. All the gang. All the boys. Okay. At that time, the disciples came up and asked Jesus, who then is really the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay. Who's going to be the pope? <laughs> you know, who's going to be our boss? You know, type of thing. Who's going to be the pope? You might, I'm just putting this in colloquial language. Unless, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? All right, and verse 2, he, that's Jesus, called the little child to himself. Probably he was sitting there and he, you know, you know, maybe put him on his lap. He put him in the midst of them and said, maybe he took him up in his arms, you know, he's made sure that he was front and center, this child. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, and again, this would have been all the disciples who were there. I say to you, this is plural. This is all these people and the, the audience that would have been there as well because we know there was more than just the 12 disciples oftentimes. They had a whole variety. They had all their alternates. <laughs> they had the alternates. They had the women. They had the group of people, the curious, the, the onlookers. They had, I say to you, unless you repent, change, turn about, and become like little tr children, 
little children, trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. So unless you're going to repent and have this attitude of humility, this attitude of trusting your heavenly Father, in this case it's Jesus Christ, because his child was willing to come to Jesus, wasn't afraid of him, willing to come to him and let him hold him, lift him up, you know, place him there, however it was. Verse 4, whoever will humble himself, therefore, and become like one of these children, trusting and loving, lowly, forgiving, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, as I said already, who was a child trusting? A child was trusting Jesus. He wasn't going to hurt him or not, wasn't going to harm him or any of these other things. He had perfect confidence in that. Verse 5, and whoever receives and accepts and welcomes one little children like this for my sake. Whose sake? Was it Peter's sake? For my sake and in my name, in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, receives and accepts and welcomes who? Me. Me. Who is the authority among the group of disciples? Was it Peter? Or is it Jesus? Verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in and acknowledge and cleave to me to stumble and sin, that is, who entices them or hinders him in right conduct in thought, as he Amplified expands. So whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in and acknowledge and cleave to me to stumble and sin, it would be better. <laughs> it would be more advantageous, less painful for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and sunk in the depth of the sea. Have you ever seen a millstone? Yeah, I still remember, that. I've seen a number of millstones in the course of my life, you know, and, you know, to have one hung around your neck, you're not going anyplace. <laughs> you're not moving. Anyway, these things are enormous, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Woe to the world, Jesus said in verse 7, for such temptations to sin and influences do, to do wrong. Yes, woe to the world because of the temptations to sin and to do wrong. It is necessary, Jesus acknowledged, that temptations come, but woe to the person or on whose account or by whom the temptation comes. Whoever is delivering this temptation to sin, who is trying to use their influence to have someone do what's wrong, Jesus said it's going to, it would be better off for them, it would be faster and quicker if you just you know, hung a millstone around their neck and dropped them in the ocean. Wow, that's something to say. We don't want to put, I don't want to put, uh, you know, any stumbling blocks or temptations to sin before any of you. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to do that as an episcopos in the church of God. I wouldn't want to do that. What is sin? Let's go to 1 John 3, 4. I just want you to show, I want you to, you know, we need to know. 1 John 3, 4, everyone who commits, that's practice practices sin is guilty of lawlessness, of lawlessness, for that is what sin is, lawlessness. And as the Amplified expands it, the breaking, violating of God's law by transgression or neglect, being unrestrained and unregulated by his commands and his will. You know, Jesus, remember, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, okay? It is an easy yoke. It's easy to bear. But God does restrain us. He does regulate us. He does teach us and lead us. It's not, we don't do our own thing in the church of God if, we're, if we truly are indwelt by the Spirit. We don't. Let's go down to Matthew 5 and verse 17. Yes, woe to the world for such temptations to sin and the influences to do wrong. Matthew 5, 17. 18. Jesus said at, you know, the Mount of Beatitudes, at the beginning of his ministry, he, he made this plan, point plain to all of his disciples and the people who were in attendance who were listening to him. Do not think that I have come to do away with or undo, and this Greek word here is kata 
luo, kata luo, to do away with or undo the law or the prophets. I have not come to do away with or to undo, but to complete and fulfill them. Verse 18, for truly I tell you, until the sky and earth pass away and perish, if you're Chinese living in Beijing, maybe you think the sky and the earth has passed away and perished because of all the pollution. No. Anyways, I tell you, until the sky and the earth pass away and perish, not one smallest letter nor one little hook, that is a certain identifying of certain Hebrew letters, will pass from the law. We're talking about how they wrote the different letters until all things, all things that foreshadows are accomplished and all things, brethren, are not accomplished. You don't have to read too much in the book of Revelation to see that that's true, do you? you? Really, all things have not been accomplished. Jesus said, don't think I've come to undo it. Don't think I've come to do away with the law of the prophets. But so many people think just the opposite. This word uh, to do away with or undo, as I said, was uh, the word is kata luo. And it's, it's formed from two different words. It's formed from kata, which is a preposition, it's properly, it's, it's to, to kata means to go down from a higher to a lower plane. Okay, again, it's kata luo, you know, to do away with or, or uh, you know, or undo. Kata is to go down from a higher to a lower plane, literally to break up, to overthrow, to destroy, to like unyoke or unharness a carriage horse or a pack animal. The lexicon says the figurative expression originates in the circumstances that put, uh, put up for the night, the straps and the packs of the beasts of burden are unbound and taken off. Kata, so that's what katam is. And then kataluo, okay, because it's a form from these two words together. Kataluo is properly to loose, unleashed, to released, so that something no longer binds or holds together. So it says, no longer think that I've come to kataluo, the law and the prophets. I've no longer, you know, I'm not coming to take from a higher plane down to a lower plane to break up or overthrow, to un, like you're unharnessing or releasing and unbinding so that something doesn't hold together anymore. He says, don't think that. I haven't come to do that. But most people think just the opposite, don't they? Let's go back to Matthew 18 and verse 15. Back to Matthew 18, verse 15. Because Jesus, we ended up before, we said, woe to the world but for such temptations to sin and to influences to do wrong, okay? And we talked a little bit about what sin was. We just talked about, you know, the whole attitude that Jesus had to the law and the prophets. He wasn't coming to kataluo to, you know, bring it down and, and you, know, on, you know, make it so it can't, doesn't hold together anymore. But in Matthew 15, 18 and verse 15, let's go back and we'll take up this, this chapter in Matthew. If your brother wrongs you, okay, so here we're talking about something, we're talking about human relationship dispute, a conflict between people. They're not getting along. If your brother wrongs you, go and show him his fault between you and him privately. If he listens to you, you've won your brother back. But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two others so that every word may be confirmed and upheld by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay, so how things were to be done in the church. It just wasn't anonymous accusations, okay, or somebody doesn't like somebody and they can, you know, get them turfed out of the church or something like this. No, that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Mm -mm. Verse 17, if he pays no attention to them, he refusing to listen and obey, tell it to the church, to the ecclesia, to the called out ones. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a pagan and a tax collector. Verse 18 here, Matthew 18, 18. Okay, here's the con, I just gave you the context. It was a personal dispute between two individuals. Somebody didn't like somebody else. They, you know, something happened. Verse 18, truly I tell you, whatever you forbid, okay, because the context was that if somebody wasn't doing this, you would take it to the church, to the called out ones, whatever you forbid and declare to be improper on the lawful earth must be what is already forbidden in heaven. Perfect passive participle, okay? You can't just come up with new stuff. There is, if you were using our modern legal, there's case law. There's case law. You've gotta follow what's, what's there, okay? 
And whatever you permit and declare proper and lawful on earth must be what is already permitted in heaven. Now, in the basics of Greek grammar by William D. Mons, he gives a clear and basic insightful explanation of the underlying Greek text, showing that what Jesus taught is entirely different from what many religious authorities assume, teach, and practice. He writes, and I'm, we're quoting here uh, that, that from uh, William Mons in The Basics of Greek Grammar. In some translations of Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18, it sounds like Jesus promised his disciples that whatever they bound on earth would be bound in heaven and whatever they loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven. In other words, they had the power to bind and loose in hev and heaven, that is to say God, would simply back up their decrees. Okay, they decide it, heaven does it. Okay, but, Mont says here in the basics of biblical Greek grammar, but the matter is not quite so simple. The actions described in heaven are future perfect passes, which could be translated, will have already been bound in heaven, will have already been loosed in heaven. In other words, the heavenly decree confirms the earthly one is based on a prior verdict God has already made. And of course, then you can look at Psalms 119.89, where it's forever. Psalms 119, verse 89, where, you know, it's the, the, the link here for forever. O Lord, Yahweh, your word is settled in the heavens. God's word is settled in the heavens. Now, if we turn, go back here to Matthew 18, we'll go to verse 19, we'll pick it up. Again, I tell you, if two of you will on earth will agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together, the, the Amplified expands, about whatever, okay, whatever here is viewing the whole in terms of the individual parts, okay, what, you know, it's viewing the whole picture getting the big picture. When you agree to something uh, about whatever, getting the whole, the big picture, they may ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, drawn together as my disciples, into my name, or in my name, there I am. There I am. That's Strong's 1510, Amy. Amy, this is, it's I am Jesus in the midst of them. For wherever two or three are drawn into my name, I am in the midst of them. Amy is that great basic Greek verb which expresses being, to be, to be. And of course, you know, it's this I am, you know, it's, 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 it, it goes right along with the fact that Christ is eternal. He's always there. And it was the I am, I was, I will be. The formula in the Greek, ego, a me, ego, a me, harks back to God's only name, Yahweh. Yahweh. You know, I've talked about that quite a bit. The one who always was, who always is, and always will be. You know, it's John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. In Exodus 3, 4, you know, who do you say? I am, <laughs> you know, I am who I am. This is the one. In the midst of them, when the disciples come there, I am is in the midst with them. I'm in the midst of them when they come together. Jesus said in John, if you turn with me to John 14, 6, John 14, 6, and we'll be reading this soon, a few more weeks. John 14, 6 in the Amplified says, Jesus said to him, I am a me, the Strong's 15, 10, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Pope. Is that what's written here? Stuff through the Bishop of Rome? The Episcopos of Rome? Is that what's written here? No. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through me. 
Let's go to John chapter 9 and verse 31. Gospel of John. You know, John was writing towards the end, again, as I said, of the first century, you know, in the 90s AD. Almost this is a universally held, you know, from, the, from that aspect. He was filling in the blanks. You can see a little bit of what he wrote in 3 John, some of the problems he was facing. John 9, 31, John quotes uh, uh, here in Breaking In because here's a story about a man who had been healed, who had been born blind. And this born man who was born blind made this testimony to those leaders, to those leaders who thought they had the power to bind and loose as they saw fit. Then they would kick people out of the assembly of believers as they saw fit on whatever basis they wanted to. But this man said, and he was, of course, kicked out for this testimony. <laughs> hey, John 9, 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He, he testified to them, God doesn't listen to sinners. You know, wink, wink. But if anyone is, uh, you know, is God-fearing and a worshiper of him and does his will, Okay. Your worship of God and what? It's not just what you say, but what you do and does his will. He, that is God, listens to him. So to for God to listen to you, if you're asking him to intervene and help for the church to, to ask, if, you know, on a, in resolving disputes and something like, something like this, we have to worship God. And, and if, first of all, and we have to be uh, a, a doer of his will. God listens to him. Yeah, the man who made this testimony was kicked out. <laughs> he was given the boot by those religious leaders who thought they had the power to bind and loose and who threw him out of the congregation. But Jesus went and found him. But Jesus went and found him and brought him to him and brought him to his people, his true church. Now, who is our mediator between us and God the Father? Who is our mediator? Is it the Pope? Is it the Pope? Let's go to Acts. Let's turn here to the uh, book of Acts, written by Luke. Book of Acts, and we'll go to chapter 7. Appropriate this time of year. A little Passover, a little pass, bit of a Passover story here. Uh, Luke's cha uh, Acts chapter 7, and we'll go to verse 30. Acts chapter 7 and verse 30. And when 40 years were fulfilled, okay, this is the time that Moses was in the wilderness, you know, after, after he had to, uh, you know, quickly, you know, leave town, you know, but so Pharaoh didn't get him. And when 40 years were fulfilled, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire in the bush in the desert of Mount Sinai. Of course, this is Stephen's testimony. Now, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the vision, and he drew near to consider it, and the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses began to tremble, and he dared not look upon it. And the Lord said to him, Loose the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Only God makes things holy. It's only God who makes things holy. Verse 34, I have been watching and I have seen the harsh treatment of my people in Egypt. Yet God is not dead. I have heard their groaning and I have come down to bring them out and now come, I will send you to Egypt. Okay, who's going to be the Lord's, the I am, the Yahweh's mediator? This Moses whom they refused, saying, who appointed you as a ruler and a judge? Okay, that was 40 years earlier. This one did God send to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Okay, he was going to be the mediator. This one led them out after working wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. 
Okay, you can read the whole account in Exodus. Under no circumstances do you get the idea that Moses was doing it by his own power. <laughs> I, you can't read that text and come up with that. I don't care how you do it and how badly, you know, or allegorically you want to read it. Forget it, you know, okay? I mean, I won't respect you if you say Moses had this, was a great mag uh, magician and he could do it by his own power. Forget it. This is the Moses who said to the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up for you from among your brethren like me. Him shall you hear. Okay, here was a warning, something right up front, that God was going to raise up a prophet like him in this role as a mediator. And you better hear him, yeah, Moses is saying. Okay, in verse 38, I'm going to switch here to the Philip's uh, New Testament uh, translation. Verse 38 here of Acts 7. In that church in the desert, this was the man who was the mediator between the divine messenger who used to talk with him on Mount Sinai and our fathers. This was the man who received words, living words, which were to be given to you. And this was the man to whom our fathers turned a deaf ear. They disregarded him and in their hearts hankered after Egypt. And they said to Aaron, make gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Yes, he was a man, he had received words, living words, which he was commanded and he was to give to the people. He was commanded and he did the miracles at God's request to deliver the people. Moses was that mediator under the old covenant that was made at Mount Sinai between Yahweh, who stood on the top and, and told the people, gave them his commandments, his ordinances, his statutes, that of how they should live and how they should worship him as a whole nation. He gave that. There wasn't to individuals, it was to the whole nations. It was a national covenant. By the way, you can go on to COG webcast and look in our archives. I've done a whole series. If you're new to the, to the broadcast, it's a whole series on the covenant. So he gave that to them, that they might have a relationship with him, that they might know how he wanted them to worship him. He didn't leave it up to their own imagination. The pagan peoples of the world do their own thing. They always have done their own thing. Most of humanity has already always done their own thing. What made the people who lived under that Sinai covenant different from the rest of the world is they were doing what God had told them to do. That those living words that he gave through Moses, that he mediated. I mean, he spoke some of them directly to them, directly. That's what's remarkable about the Ten Commandments. But the rest, you know, people didn't want to stand there and shake all day. They, Moses, please hear this for us. Okay, from this standpoint, who is the mediator between us and God the Father? Is it the Pope? Is it the Pope? Okay, to see, sit in Moses' seat, as it were? From the standpoint, who was that prophet that was going to be raised up like me and that Moses wrote, you know, make sure you hear him. Let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, again, staying with the Amplified. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, as the Apostle Paul wrote, for there is only one God and only one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. I don't see the Bishop of Rome down here. Do you? <laughs> Let's go to Hebrews 8 and verse 6. Hebrews 8, verse 6. Staying again with the Amplified. But as it is now, he, that's Christ's meaning, has acquired a priestly ministry which is as much superior and more excellent as the covenant of which he is the mediator. He's the mediator, or as the uh, Amplified expands it, the arbiter, the agent. He is the mediator, is superior and more excellent because it is enacted and rests. It is enacted, this new covenant, and rests upon more important promises. Promises that are sublimer, that are higher, that are nobler, that are even more eternal as far as our lives are concerned. Let's go to Hebrews 9 and verse 15. 
Hebrews 9 and verse 15, the Holman Christian Standard Bible <laughs> puts it this way. Therefore he, that is Christ the Messiah, is the mediator of a new covenant. So that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And of course, there is no forgiveness where there is no forgiveness is needed where there is no sin. But sin has always been around mankind. Even before the, 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 the pronouncements of the law, before you know, God stood on top of Mount Sinai, yeah, there was death. There was death because there was plenty of sin. Just like we have plenty of sin now, and we have those that tempt many to sin in this world. Oh yeah, all sorts. There are temptations under every place you look. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is more alive today than ever. It really is. Let's go to Mark, Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. I'll stay with the Holman Christian Standard Bible here and reading. Mark 7 and verse 6. He, Jesus, answered them. Isaiah prophesied, that's Isaiah the prophet. Okay, Jesus is quoting the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. And he was addressing those who had taken to themselves the authority to bind and loose. Contradiction to the will of God. Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 7, they worship me in vain. In vain. That's without you know, any sort of meaningful effect. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Disregarding the commandment of God, you keep the tradition of men. Mark wrote down here for Jesus' comment. This is the Mark, of course, the Gospel of Mark, is widely recognized as the first of the Gospels that was written. Let's go to verse 9. Verse 9. And he said to them, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. Yeah, that was the problem of the Pharisees. They were doing it. They were invalidating God's command in order to maintain their tradition. What have the bishops of Rome done? Have they invalidated God's commands in order to substitute it with a, with a commandment of men, their own tradition? Let's go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, verse 6, and I'm switching back to the Amplified here, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Apostle Paul, beginning here, you know, in this part of the letter about the condition of your church, writing the condition, you know, to the Corinthians, your boasting is not in good, is not good, he said. Indeed, it is most unseemly entirely out of place. Oh, they thought they were very progressive, okay? They thought they were very progressive because they were tolerating sin. Do you not know that just a little leaven will ferment the whole lump of dough? Okay, he's taking this analogy that you put a little yeast into a, a, a lump of dough, okay, just like you would make a roll or a bread or some, some sort of leavened bread product. Okay, you put just a little in there and give it a little time and it will leaven the whole lump of dough. Verse 7, Paul says, where does he get this from? We'll think about that. Verse 7, purge, that's clean out the old leaven, that you may be fresh, that is new dough, still uncontaminated as you are. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Okay, what Paul is referring to is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where every year the people of Israel, according to the commandment that was given in the Torah and in the law of God, they were told to clean out the old leaven on a yearly basis. It was a yearly teaching opportunity for them to learn that they were to get sin out of their life. They were to repent, clean out the old leaven, that you may be new dough, fresh dough, 
and uncontaminated. Yes, as you are, because of course they had done that. The church there in Corinth was doing this. They were still taking the leaven out of their homes there in, in Corinth. For Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast, the Apostle Paul says, and he's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's talking about Passover. This is to the Corinthian brethren. The brethren who later, okay, some, some 30 or 40 years after this was written, you have this Clement, a bishop of Rome, who is threatening people and excommunicating certain of the elders there in Corinth who weren't paying attention to what he wanted to do. Let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of vice and malice and wickedness. Yeah, that guy there, the Bishop of Rome, he was threatening them, and the scholars all recognized it was a threat. He was asserting this, the primacy, the Bishop of Rome, making, he wanted to be first among them, as the Apostle John later said. He wanted to have the primacy. Therefore, let us keep the feast, Feast of unleavened bread, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of vice and malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of purity, nobility, honor, and sincerity, and unadulterated truth. Yes, let us keep the feast, the apostle says, with the unleavened bread of unadulterated truth. Does the Roman Catholic Church have the authority to bind and to loose when it comes to changing the observance of the Passover as recorded in the scriptures? Do they have the authority to replace it with a non-scriptural custom and such as Easter, which is not found in the Bible? Easter mediated by the bishops of Rome, historically. Sometime there, about the time of 135 AD, during the time of Emperor Hadrian, when it became very unpopular to be connected in any way with anything that might be thought of as Jewish. What do you think? They were there for over a hundred years in Jerusalem. The elders of the Church of God at Jerusalem the ordained elders, as you know, Eusebius and Epiphanius record, they, they know. They kept the Passover on the 14th of Nisan. They didn't keep Easter. They kept the seventh day Sabbath. They didn't keep Sunday. That is the testimony of history. What do you think? As for me and my house, we'll be keeping the Lord's new covenant Passover beginning at the beginning part of Nisan 14, or Abib 14, on March 24th, shortly after sundown, what will you do?